of Americans born in this century. Now, was everyone listening to him born in that century? Nope. So he is again invoking the idea of a new generation. Born in this century, tempered by war. What war or wars? World War II in Korea, and perhaps World War I. Perhaps. If you were born in 1900, you could have fought, you could have died in World War I. A country has been engaged in global conflicts, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace. To what is he referring there? Right, the, Cold War. the Cold War, yes, almost certainly. The Cold War is a hard and bitter peace. But he doesn't use the phrase Cold War. He avoids the phrase Cold War, which would have been the obvious phrase to pick. Instead, he calls it a hard and bitter peace. Well, it's a, it's a good choice of words. Wouldn't work so well with Cold War. Peace, P, proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Quite a, quite a long and complex sentence. But it has connections with everything else that has been uh, said in the speech so far. It creates an organic whole. We are going forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. We are a new generation. Now, he says, unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights. It's pretty presumptuous, but I would suggest that perhaps he doesn't need the verb witness and could just say an unwilling to permit the slow undoing. I just think it's a little stronger because it says we will not let that happen. Of course you're not going to witness it and let it happen if you're not going to permit it. Do you understand that difference? In other words, I think the word uses it's, it's a little excessive. That's really one of the very few examples in this speech that I think one could possibly argue for editing of word choice. It is so well constructed. Then let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill. And that goes back to the pair of friend and foe. And it's also wonderfully alliterative. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, back to friend, oppose any foe, back to foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Again, alliteration, survival and success. And wonderfully balanced, wonderfully um, uh, arranged. Now, is it hyperbole? It's a very strong statement. We shall pay any price, bear any burden. Yes, you find it on American passports. It's quite a statement because terrible prices have been paid. So then he continues on, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. He doesn't have to say the survival because he could just say to assure the success because if it succeeds, it will obviously survive. But I think for stylistic reasons, he wants to make this, it's balanced. Do you hear how almost every clause is balanced? And relatively short, even in a long, complex sentence, the phrases are, they're short. They're short. This much we pledge and more. Now, one of the wonderful things about this address is you've got some long sentences that are quite complex, and then you have some really short, simple sentences. This much we pledge, dash, and more to those old allies. Now, these are perhaps friends that are considered particularly close, whose cultural and spiritual origins we share. I don't know that if he would write this today. I don't know if he could write it in 2018 this way. But who's he thinking of in 1961? Probably England. It had been traditional for every president in the first overseas trip they took, generally, to go to Great Britain and then on to Europe because of the alliance during World War II particularly, but also because of the notion that after all, America was created out of British colonies by a revolution. 
to those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share. I think, I think you would have trouble saying that today. I don't think it would work today as well. We pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do. For we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. Again, a kind of balance and a kind of parallelism. United, there is little we cannot do. Divided, there is little we can do. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, what is happening in the world at this time in the late 50s and all throughout the 1960s in terms of uh, independent nations and states? What's happening? Uh, a retreat of colonialism around yes. the world? Yes, the era of, of imperial colonialism is fast ending. Mm -hmm. And there are a great number of new countries which are being created which are independent and free just at about this time. I mean, take a look at a world map from 1950 and compare it with a world map from 1970, 75. Seth? I was going to say also, like, due to that independent nation, it also led to a threat or a lack of communism around the globe. Yes, this whole notion of what are these new independent nations going to do? Are they going to be friends? Are they going to be foes? Are they going to be neutral? And, you know, there could be fighting over them or proxy wars in them has certainly occurred. You have a vast number of new countries that are independent and free. Are they going to align themselves with the Soviet Union or are they going to align themselves with the United States? Or are they going to be what was called and what is still called often but then was called non-aligned nations? That was the phrase used. Meaning you're not going to say that you are a close ally of the United States or of the Soviet Union. We pledge our word, we've heard pledge before, that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. Well, perhaps Soviet Union. Why do you say Soviet Union? The iron, yeah. What's the association of the word iron? The iron curtain. The iron curtain, yeah. There's also another as association with the word iron, as I recall. The iron rule of Joseph Stalin. And what does Eisenhower mean? Eisen is iron. Eisenhower? Yeah, or, a, or an iron cutter. Yeah, a funny play on words. Now, you'd say, oh, this is going into, you know, this is kind of crazy detail. Oh, no, 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 it's not crazy detail. People pay attention to this. Diplomats pay attention to it. So I think iron tyranny here does suggest the Soviet bloc. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view. That's an interesting statement. We shall not always ex expect to find them supporting our view. They are non-aligned nations. But we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. Find them strongly supporting their own freedom. Here is a nested alliteration, FSSF. And you get this quite a lot in this speech. Not just alliteration, but nested alliteration. So you have one form of alliteration surrounded by the effect of alliteration of another set of sounds. And to remember that in the past, those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger, ended up inside. What does that refer to? Countries that maybe were, maybe like Cuba that wanted to. It's hard to say. Or, yeah. But I don't, know, I don't know what he's referring to there, but uh, specifically, but countries that wanted to align themselves with the Soviet Union in order to, like, you know. OK. Ahead. What, what would a tiger suggest to people at that time? Uh, yeah, perhaps, perhaps China, perhaps, but Asian. And what's that image from? I think it's from a folk tale. You know, you're going to ride the back of the tiger, you're going to end up eventually inside. So that whole paragraph is welcoming, a little admonitory, open. It's only about three sentences. It's quite remarkable to convey that much. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery. 
cuts in half break bonds mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves for whatever period is required. Not because the communists may be doing it. Were they? Yes, of course they were. Not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. That's an idealistic statement. One can say, oh, I don't really believe it. It's for some kind of advantage. But he is saying that for those in misery, the United States will stand up for human rights. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. Let me read that again. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. What are the implications of this sentence? Stop and think about it. It's one of the most remarkable sentences in the entire inaugural address, and it is almost always completely overlooked and not commented on. The way I view it is kind of as like a religious implication. Basically, in a free society, if we can't um, save the poor from mortality, that we can't like save the that we can't like save the rich from their eternal fate. I I, I don't know. I kind of see it in a religious aspect. Maybe I think it might have another more secular aspect as well. What would that be? What has eventually happened to many societies that could not help the poor? A uh, violent revolution. Yes, violent revolution. Exactly. Significant change at the very least, violent revolution in many cases. Revolution in China being an example, the revolution in Russia being an example, the revolution in many countries being an example, the revolution in many colonial societies being an example. This is a kind of warning. It's, it's a sentence that's never cited from this address. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, then, that's to be understood, it's an if-then statement. Then it cannot save the few who are rich. They will eventually perish. It's a remarkable sentence. Is there any point in time where having such a balanced, sort of like stylistically beautiful way of putting something that, um, that has like such great implications works against you and like not having people realize what the implications are because it sounds so good? Do you know what I'm saying? Or yes, I do know what you're saying. Yeah. But the language here is kept pretty simple. Yeah. And I think that's what saves it. I think what saves it too is it's only about 1,300 words. Nine minutes, 10 minutes. You wouldn't want to listen to this kind of language for an hour. It would begin to sound like a rocking horse a little, you know? You, you'd like to get on a roller coaster and ride it for a while, right? But by the fifth time, well, maybe not for you, but by the fifth time, I pretty much so had it with the Santa Cruz roller coaster. I, maybe another week or a month later. But um, when you listen to something that's this patterned for a long period of time, it will get monotonous. And one of the very remarkable things about this is that it's highly patterned, but it's also varied in its patterning. The sentence length is varied. The use of alliteration is varied. The antitheses are varied. It's really, it's, and it's done with language that word for word is relatively simple. Did you have to look up any word reading this speech? No, this is not, this is not a speech that has hard terms in it at all. To our sister republics south of the border. Nice phrase, why are they sister republics? Sounds good, why might they be called sister republics? Many have constitutions based on the U.S. That's part of it, yes. The revolution of Simon Bolivar and the whole liberating of many of those countries. And also they're in the same hemisphere. And we talked earlier about the Monroe Doctrine, where the United States felt a responsibility for maintaining a certain degree of democracy. Now you can say the United States violated that in many ways through economic imperialism and other forms of control. but. Kennedy is trying to make a new start with the sister republics south of the border. We offer a special pledge. Sister republics south of the border, we offer a special pledge. He's been talking about pledges. This is a special one now. To convert our good words into good deeds 
in a new alliance for progress. And he actually, the Kennedy administration, had a program called the Alliance for Progress, which was a way to try to help countries in South America to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. But let this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. We've got alliteration of S, of G, of F, of C, and of P, all within five lines, used sparingly. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas, and let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. Is that what happened completely? No. Cuba, of course, became strongly aligned with the Soviet Union. To that World Assembly of Sovereign States, the United Nations, our last best hope. Where does that phrase come from? What president had used that phrase, our last best hope? Yes, it's Lincoln's phrase. The phrase had been used by other writers in other contexts before Lincoln, but it's a phrase that people closely studying American political rhetoric would identify with Lincoln. The United Nations, our last best hope. Now that's interesting. He's not calling the United States the last best hope, which is in essence what Lincoln did. Now the last best hope is the United Nations. The world has changed in an age where the instruments of war have far outpaced the instruments of peace, we renew our pledge of support to prevent it from becoming merely a forum for invective. In other words, the accusation of the United Nations long has been that it is simply a debating society, that it doesn't do anything. It's a place where, what, what does invective mean? Insult, name calling. You know. That, that the United Nations should not become that, to prevent it from becoming merely a form for invective, to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak, and to enlarge the area in which its writ may run. Now, what does that phrase mean, its writ may run? It's a phrase that, um, it's getting to be a little archaic these days, but it's a phrase that means something. What does it mean to say a writ may run or a writ runs somewhere? What is a writ? Maybe that's a word that you didn't know that could be looked up, but what does a, a writ mean here? It's a nice sounding phrase, but we have to get to what it actually means. Does writ may run mean like it can serve its purpose? Yes, it can serve its purpose, at, but even a little stronger than that, that is to say, it's writ, meaning its influence, its power. It's um, almost its jurisdiction, but he doesn't say that. Because if he said jurisdiction, then that would suggest the violation of certain national sovereignty. But he is saying that the United Nations should come to a place where it will enlarge the area in which its writ may run. In other words, its influence will become greater. A writ is a legal term. Okay? And a writ may run means an area in which that writ is valid as a form of jurisdiction. The it's, word is still used today. It's, it's not actually an archaic word. Finally, okay, now here we are finally, but we're only halfway through the speech. So why is this finally? Because he says finally at the end of the speech. So we got two finallys. This is the final in the series of pledges that he's making to groups. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Which are based on friends and foes, particularly here, friends. Finally, to those nations who would make themselves our adversary. I love that phrase. Why doesn't he say finally to our adversaries? 